Hi everyone. Well, it looks like I'm able to kind of wind this thing down, get this uh, Arizona history uh, into the 20th century in this video as best I can. I still have plenty of questions, but before I get started, I want to uh, clear up a couple things from previous my previous video. You know, I tend to have a lot of coulda, shoulda, would'ves. And um, first of all, for my last video, I made an error in locating where some cliff dwellings were. And I had located them where the X's are. And they're actually down lower. And it, it really makes a difference in the grand scheme of things because it's below the muggy and rim. There's up to a 2,000 foot drop in elevation. Maybe not all of it. A thousand feet, 500 feet, it's still a lot. And with that water coming down, it, you know, in my opinion, could really have created a waterfall coming through. And also, I uh, second guessed myself a little bit, but I think I'm okay with it. If I said that there was no Salt River, and I'm going to stick to that. With a purple dotted line, I was wondering if that could be the Salt River. But, uh, you know, it could be like some sort of a leftover. Uh, but it doesn't join up with the uh, Gila River in the right place. And it's not nearly long enough. So, um, I am going to, you know, stick to my story that the Gila River was not present in 1850. Um, just a couple other things um, that are worth mentioning in regard to when I was, you know, looking into things, doing the 1850 history and making a case for a big flood or multiple floods, big ones in Arizona, is I came across the Zuni Salt Lake. I mean, what's a salt lake doing out in the middle of New Mexico? And also, I forgot to mention about the sand dunes, big sand dunes in Colorado. They're kind of south southwest on the uh, southern border, big sand dunes. You know, and if it was at the edge of a flood, it would dump sand. Likewise, White Sands, New Mexico, in the southwest corner of the state. And I meant to give a big thank you to the Adam Thew channel. Uh, I, he's a good photographer. He's got a great Arizona channel. Uh, uh, pay him a visit. He has some cool videos. Okay, and onward we go. Um, I just want to compare notes. Uh, this is a map from 1846 and the other video had an 1850 map and they do line up with one another in regard to how the course of the Colorado River has changed. Uh, all the river systems have changed. There's rivers gone and rivers that have appeared in the meantime. So the, uh, there's been a lot of geographical changes throughout the state. So there's a confirmation from um, what uh, four years prior to the map I used in the last video. And here's a map of current Arizona. And um, take note of how the Colorado River flows up on the left hand side of the state border. It makes sort of an end shape and then goes on up into Utah and, and then into Colorado. So that's current. And we will look at the territory of Arizona map. And this is 1876. So what's this? 26 years later. Um, Arizona became a territory in 1863, and it did not become a state until 1912. It was the 48th state. 
it was last in line in the uh, co or continuous states. You know, with the only ones after were Hawaii and Alaska. So we're we're a new state around here. Okay, let's. I uh, want to look at the map and show that from 1850 to 1876, the rivers are looking very current to today. So something seriously radical may have happened between 1850 and 1876 because this is looking like current waterways. Now, um, the, I struggle to find any kind of maps to read, so I put in the red dotted lines and um, for the waterways and then did some labeling where the future Hoover Dam, when they first built it, uh, what, in the early 30s, it was called the Boulder Dam. I'm going to play clips of that, of the construction. And they, and prior to that, about uh, 1910, in that range, uh, they built the Roosevelt Dam, and both took several years. But the point of this map, here we are just 26 years later, and the rivers are where they are currently. No big major changes. You know, like the little Colorado, not there in 1850, it's there now. The Verde River, Tonto Creek, both in place now. Uh, the You know, the um, Colorado changed course. The Gila River has been pretty stable throughout. And if you don't mind taking note, you know, I said that the, the course has changed a little bit where the ink is so black, uh, up where uh, the upper Grand Canyon area is of the Colorado River. It's not so M-shaped here, okay? And um, I'm going to be playing a couple of uh, portions of uh, Department of Interior videos. And this is a, a snapshot off one of them. And I have the red dotted line where the river is, and there's a very faint line where I put the yellow. And I'm wondering if they did not use that. Um, this goes back to my previous video. If they did not somehow utilize that uh, sulfurous pyramid canyon. Um, because the course is looking a little different. Also, as you will see in the video clips of the Hoover Dam or Boulder Dam, is that they did, they blasted through rock and built tunnels to divert the water. And I was really not clear if they utilized this canyon or not, but the Grand Canyon is running a little bit different course. Okay, I mean, I you know, so I think these things are a, a lot more recent. I you know, I'm not a hundred percent sure, like if they use that Falthrus Pyramid Canyon, but things have changed quite a bit, as well as um, uh, you know, the Salt River Canyon. I think is really from the recent past or it's flooded multiple times. You know, I get it with Arizona. Um, you know, you could have drought and you could have flash flooding, you know, and you just plan and live accordingly. You know, you don't camp in a canyon in, uh, the rainy season because you could, you know, experience a flash flood, for example. Um, and it makes me wonder if the previous native people that were so heavily populated around the Phoenix area, if they had some 
control, some kind of damming system to capture and control the water flow? I mean, these are valid questions because, I mean, when they, their narrative says they dug those canals out of, with a stick and you could see they knew what they were doing with cement lining in these canals. You know, I mean, the narrative is not adding up. Okay, so I, I guess that's the end of the, my, end of the, um, my story about Arizona history. I am in a, uh, I am thinking things were very recent, like at a major large scale catastrophes multiple and one in you know I'm gonna say one after between 1850 and 1876 there was a major disaster going on okay I'm gonna play clips first of uh, the building of the uh, Roosevelt Dam, that's what dams up the uh, Salt River that feeds into Phoenix. That's their major water supply. And I'm uh, from there going to play clips of the construction of the Hoover Dam, or at that time it was named uh, the Boulder Dam. And I appreciate you watching. Have a good day, everybody. It was built stone by stone in the punishing extremes of the American Southwest. It gathers the water that transformed a desert into a lush place to live. Over the past century, Arizona's Salt River Valley has grown from a small farming community into the country's fifth largest metropolis a venture that started with a handful of farmers. What they found here were, was a good climate by and large and uh, good soil and then kind of an itinerant water situation. And for Arizona to become prosperous, to become a center of population and activity, required getting water to central Arizona. Their vision was to provide abundant water to an arid land, a structure of unprecedented size and scope, unlike any reclamation project ever attempted in the United States. Homesteaders began arriving in the valley in 1868. And within 20 years, more than 100,000 acres were cultivated and producing alfalfa, dates, citrus, figs, and walnuts. Yet every farmer worried about getting his fair share of water. So some had a dependable supply, others didn't. And in many times, there was contention on whose water it was and whose water it wasn't. At the turn of the 20th century, Arizona farmers battled to control an erratic river. They faced blistering heat, torrential floods, and punishing drought. To prosper in such harsh conditions required ingenuity and fortitude. Arizona settlers needed to create a reliable water supply, but it wouldn't be easy. They had to establish clear water rights, consolidate a disjointed canal system, and raise the capital to build an enormous storage dam. Fortunately for the residents of the Salt River Valley, budding ideals in Washington were about to dovetail with the needs of a small farming community in the far off west. One of Theodore Roosevelt's first tasks as president was to sign the Newlands Reclamation Act into law. But before the government would commit to financing and building the dam, the Reclamation Service needed to be guaranteed repayment. In an unprecedented act, the settlers set aside their differences and every farmer, rancher, and businessman pledged their personal land as collateral to the government. The willingness of these people to put up their lands for security 
was a, a, an act of faith, so to speak, and was a burden for many, but a burden they were willing to take because they knew it was the only way they could secure their future. To negotiate with the federal government as one entity, landowners formed the Salt River Valley Water Users Association and elected Benjamin Fowler president. In 1903, the association filed its Articles of Incorporation written by Judge Kibbe. The Articles of Incorporation introduced electricity in the association's mission, laying the foundation to supply valley residents with two essentials of modern life, water and power. But the president, the fledgling reclamation service, and the people of the Salt River Valley likely had no idea what serious work it would be to build a dam that could hold back the volatile Salt River. After meandering through the vast Tonto Basin, the Salt River meets Tonto Creek and flows into a narrow gorge. Known as the Crossing, this tight slot with sturdy uplifted cliffs created an ideal location to impound a massive amount of water. It would take 344,000 cubic yards of masonry stone and almost as many barrels of cement to build the entire project, which included a sluicing tunnel, power canal, roadway, and a powerhouse. And so this was a, a really big project that allowed the new reclamation service to really shine and, and you know, do that engineering feat that was, that was really quite amazing at the time. In 1905, O'Rourke and Company, the contractor, pledged to have the bulk of the dam's masonry work completed in two years. But unforeseen circumstances stalled progress and tripled construction time to six demanding years. No one had factored in the possibility of millions of gallons of water tearing through the construction site. Months of work swept away in hours. Just when they get almost to the same point that they were again, Mother Nature strikes again and here comes another flood and washes their work away again for a second time. And we're not talking does it just wash away the dam and the work that they've done on the dam, it's washing away all their equipment. Finally, after three years of painstaking preparation, the six-ton cornerstone for the massive dam was laid on September 20th, 1906. In 1908, a writer from National Geographic described the scene. Great blocks of sandstone weighing 10 tons each are swung out on cranes and set in place. When night comes, myriads of electric lights burst forth weirdly illuminating a busy army of toilers in a shadowy canyon. It is a wondrous scene, awesome and inspiring. The need for power to facilitate construction turned a dam initially designed for water storage into a multi-purpose hydroelectric project. With the dam almost finished, Disputes over water rights in the Salt River Valley needed to be definitively settled. Well, Judge Edward Kent had to figure out exactly the specific amount of water that was pertinent to every parcel of land in the valley, about 236,000 acres, and he eventually got it all prioritized so that everyone knew exactly how much quantity they had and what their priority date was. Those water rights had been established and it provided the foundation for really the, the development of the Salt River Valley. The last stone was laid on February 5th, 1911. On March 18th, Theodore Roosevelt himself made the dusty journey over the Apache Trail to dedicate the dam that bears his name, a flagship for reclamation in the West. And at 5.48 in the evening, he pressed the button. Water was released from Roosevelt Dam, and the dedication was complete. The paper in town reported, a mighty roar of water rushed through the canyon and the dedication of the greatest storage dam and reservoir on earth was an accomplished fact. Finally, after some 40 years of need and eight long years of battling the elements, the dam stood proudly between the canyon walls. 
280 feet high, 184 feet thick at the bottom, and 16 feet wide at the top, this elegant crescent of stone began to fulfill its promise, to impound the waters that would bring life and opportunity to the valley below. centuries, the turbid waters of the Colorado River battered their way through the forbidding canyons of its 1,700-mile course, traversing the arid southwest. For the most part, little known except to the native Indians and a few parties of intrepid explorers. Draining a vast region of mountain and desert, entering seven of the largest western states, it poured its waters southward into the Gulf of California, carrying into its delta a tremendous volume of silt and periodically overflowing the prosperous towns and rich agricultural districts near its mouth with devastating floods. From the time of its discovery, it remained a challenge to engineers who sought to control it, until the enactment in 1928 of the Boulder Canyon Project Act, authorizing the construction of Boulder Dam. In Black Canyon, where the Colorado River forms the boundary between Nevada and Arizona, in the very heart of the great desert of the Southwest, the United States Department of the Interior, through its Bureau of Reclamation, was directed to proceed with the construction of this mightiest of dams. It was not long before roads and rail lines had penetrated into the very lowest reaches of the canyon. To provide these arteries of transportation, thousands of tons of virgin rock were blasted from the age-old walls of the gorge. Thus, the first thunders of man's determination to conquer the Colorado River reverberated between the sheer cliffs of the canyon which heretofore had known only the hot silence of the desert and the roar of the river's angry floods. The boring of four diversion tunnels to carry the stream around the dam site during construction, two on each side of the river, 56 feet in diameter and averaging 4,000 feet in length, constituted the first major construction operation. The drilling jumbos used on this job were mounted on motor trucks to facilitate handling and were capable of driving from 24 to 30 powder holes into the heading simultaneously by means of drifter drills. The tunnels were excavated through the rock simultaneously from four headings, one at either end and two boring in opposite directions from a river level auxiliary tunnel located about midway on the main bore. A pioneer drift was drilled at top line and closely followed by the excavation for the complete 56 foot bore. Thousands of tons of drilled steel were used in this work and the sharpening shops were kept working at top speed night and day to maintain a steady supply. After the powder holes had been drilled and the rock blasted, power shovels and trucks moved into the tunnels for the purpose of removing the shattered material. An unbroken parade of heavy-duty trucks, each handling from eight to ten tons of rock, labored up over the steep roads cut into the canyon walls to dispose of the material in the gulches adjacent to the dam site. This phase of the task which entailed the excavation and the handling of over one and a half million cubic yards of material, was completed within a period of 13 months and was considered the most grueling portion of the work for both men and machinery. After the tunnels had been excavated, they were lined with concrete, three feet in thickness. Due to the unprecedented size of the bores, special equipment was designed to facilitate this task. The tunnels were lined in segmental sections, the invert, or base, being the first in which the concrete was placed. A gantry crane operating through the tunnel itself handled the concrete throughout this operation. The side walls were next lined behind movable steel forms, which traveled through the excavated section on rails laid from portal to portal. The top arch was placed with the use of a concrete gun operated by compressed air. To prepare the canyon walls to receive the abutments of the dam, and to remove loose and dangerous rock from the face of the cliffs overhanging the site, many tons of rock were torn away and hurled into the depths of the canyon in a series of spectacular blasts, which occurred almost daily during the period from commencement of operations at the dam site to the time when actual building of the dam began about two years later. To reach their positions on the canyon walls, 
the men engaged in the work of drilling and handling explosives for these huge blasts traveled in cages or skiffs swung on cables at heights of hundreds of feet over the river. To the casual observer, this dizzy sky ride must have seemed thrilling indeed. But to the workmen themselves, it became a matter of course and all a part of the day's job. The first step in preparing for the blast was the drilling of powder holes into the rock of the canyon wall. For this purpose, the jackhammer drill, operated by a single man, was generally used. The holes were then loaded with dynamite, and the blast set off, shattering the air with its detonation and shaking the very earth with its force. 